Great, excellent. Um, wonderful. So um, welcome everyone to our second study and struggle critical conversation. Thanks all for bearing with us as we got ourselves together on our end. Um, but our event is entitled Abolition Must Be Green. Um, huge thanks to Haymarket Books for hosting this event with us and for all of their work on the back end to make this event possible. Um, we are extremely appreciative. And thanks also to our captioner and to Coco for providing ASL interpretation services for this evening. So first, I want to acknowledge that I'm currently a settler on Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miamia, Ho-Chunk, and Ocheti Sakoan lands. Um, and I believe that we'll probably talk about this more today, but I want to acknowledge that a big part of what it means for abolition to be green is for the land to be given back um, to Indigenous people. So by way of introduction, my name is Charlotte. Um, I'm one of the organizers with Study and Struggle, and I will be the moderator for the evening. Um, and just to give a brief overview of Study and Struggle, we organize against criminalization and incarceration in Mississippi through mutual aid, political education, and community building. Each fall, we put together a bilingual Spanish and English curriculum with discussion questions and reading materials, as well as provide financial support to over 100 participants and radical study groups inside and outside prisons in Mississippi. And we also make the curriculum fully available online for other study groups across the country and the world um, to use as they see fit. And absence, it has to be green, and in order to be green, it has to be red, and in order for it to be red, it has to be international. So we at Study and Struggle um, just built, built on that and added intersectional um, as a fourth analytical category um, that we hope further moves us beyond single issue organizing. So. For today, though, we're going to be tackling what it means for abolition to be green. And we have a truly fantastic lineup of panelists tonight um, who I'm going to uh, introduce in a moment. But I wanted to explain a little bit about the format for our panel because it's going to be somewhat unique. Um, so because um, four of our panelists, Wayland, Bryant, Sophia, and Lawrence, are currently imprisoned, we have pre-recorded their remarks. So Throughout the evening, we'll hear segments from our imprisoned panelists, um, which our live panelists, BP and JT, will then kind of respond to and be in conversation with. Um, and then, fi you know, one final thing um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know about our next critical conversation, which will be November 9th um, at 7 p.m. Eastern um, with Stephen Wilson and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, the person who inspired <laughs> the framework for, for this entire curriculum. Um, and they're going to be talking about why abolition must be read. And so I, I already know that's going to be an extremely rad conversation. So definitely hope uh, to see you all back here with us in November. And then one final thing, just a bit of housekeeping, wanted to remind those tuning in that um, we should hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for Q&A with our panelists. So um, please put questions in the chat um, as they come up and we'll try to try to ask them um, before the event comes to a close. Um, great. So to kick things off, I'm going to have our two live panelists here um, with us introduce themselves and um, the pre-recorded panelists will also introduce themselves in the videos as well. Um, but just to kick us off, why don't we have um, JT, do you mind introducing yourself um, and kicking us off? No, sure. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks um, everyone uh, for joining us and thank you to the organizers, um, the folks in the background, the signers, um, and the captioners and other folks that are um, working with us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm um, on the North National Organizing Committee of People Strike, um, and also I'm an assistant professor at Arizona State University, where I lead the Black Ecologies Initiative. And I'll pass it over. Great. Um, BP, do you want to take it away with an intro? Hi, I'm BP. Um, I'm an artist and organizer. I organize with Fight Toxic Prisons. Uh, we're an abolitionist organization that fights the intersections of environmentalism and uh, prison abolition. Um, we know that prisons are toxic to everybody and the environment. And uh, yeah, so I'll just quick intro. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, BP. Um, OK, so I think with that, um, we should get to one of our first video segment. Um, so, John, do you want to 
pull that up and then we'll be back with JT and BP to kind of deconstruct and reflect on um, the words from our, um, from our other panelists. I know that I'm going to die. For me, that's a scary thing, but it's true. I don't have cancer or AIDS or any life threatening condition that I'm aware of, but I do know that one day I'll breathe my last breath and cease to exist in this body. One day I'll die. Most of the time, I don't think about it. Most of the time, I don't even want to think about it. And then sometimes in life, things happen where death is the only thing I can think of. After I got sentenced to my case, I remember counting the years to my fingers. Like, I'm 26, I got two years in, six and a half years to my minimum, 27, 28. That means I'll be 32. I'll still be healthy, young enough to have kids, start a family, get my life in order. I can still live life. But then I started thinking, well, what happens if I don't get out of my middle? Another year puts me at 33, maxing out my sentence. I'll be over 40 years old. And I'm doing all of this calculating against the inevitable. Time is my life. And I'm trying to calculate if this time is survivable. I'm comparing it to death. Will I survive prison? Then when I got to say, yeah, I learned from other prisoners that we live on a dump site for toxic coal waste. I heard about the toxic water. And a few months later, I found a, a lump on my body. And, you know, it was scary, to say the least. And I was going down medical. Uh, I wasn't getting any relief. And the medical neglect inside of prison is nothing new, right? These private companies come in. Uh, and give medical care, and of course they have a you know, profit margin to reach, and they're notorious for misdiagnosing, underdiagnosing, there's no preventative medical care. You know, you usually gotta be getting wheeled out on a stretcher before you get any real care. So, I'm going down to medical, and they say to me, like, nah, you're okay. Like, and clearly, I'm not okay. I know my body. I know I have a mom. I know something wrong. And, I was confronted. Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution. Say it. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. I was confronted with the inevitable again. Even though I tried to block it out, I kept thinking, will my time in prison be the death of me? The environmental racism that exists in the poor black communities of America today are the perpetuation of a long history of white supremacist attitudes that has sought and still seeks to disenfranchise black people in order to maintain a sense of white superiority and black inferiority. These attitudes are not a thing of the past. After the Civil War, the prison industrial complex became the vehicle to reroute the ideas of slavery and racism. When we fast forward to the civil rights movement in the period of um, black integration into white communities and schools, we enter a period of white flight where the government funded the development of suburban infrastructures so that whites could flee the inner cities where blacks were migrating to. The government then redlined those inner city communities, intentionally causing urban decay and creating what we know as our ghettos. This race-based political economic move or political strategy largely contributed to the modernization of environmental racism. To give you an idea of where I'm geographically located, I'm in the thick of the eastern anthracite region of Pennsylvania. Northumberland County. Of course, the geography of prisons shaped the lives of those inside and surrounding it in ways affecting our overall health and health risk to the point of developing the insidious monster I call cancer. Speaking of which, did you know that 
I'm incarcerated in the heart of Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, which is considered the number one highest rate of cancer clusters in the nation, surrounded by several state prisons, Mahanoy, Frackville, and where I'm presently housed at, Cole Township, coupled with two other federal facilities in the surrounding area, Allenwood and Lewisburg. Actually, looking at what's being grown, there was a lot of specialty crops that grow right here in the prison. And uh, a lot of gourmet uh, or crops that are using gourmet foods and stuff. And, you know, initially, like, to me, I was like, wow, you know, I never, I never grew none of this stuff. So it was a learning experience. But I started asking, like, as I've, as I've learned about what was growing here, I started asking, the staff, like, what are, where is this produce going? Is it going to the prisoners? You know, are we, you know, these are things that can really enhance our health, you know what I'm saying, especially people that have underlying conditions or maybe dealing, struggling with mental disability. There's a lot of stuff growing out here that can really, you know, improve uh, the health of prisons, you know, and I was just curious to see, you know, like, if if the prison was even conscious or even supportive of that, I learned that they were sending all of the produce that was grown, and they still are, to local food banks just for charitable recognition or charitable causes to get positive publicity in the media. And there was like a complete disregard or even uh, interest, you know, for, you know, prisoners being able to access these healthy foods that were growing. And, you know, they even made strict rules on those that, were growing the produce that they couldn't get caught eating it or taking it back into the unit uh, where they lived at. Like, where they, the plot was right outside of the living unit, so if they were to get a cell search or anything like that and produce was found, they would fire them and give them a major infraction. We're, you have 60 seconds remaining. This ultimately will result in, in loss of good time. It'll result in people being denied for clemency because it's a serious infraction. And, you know, just multiple other things, you know, like you can't get a job for a while. So they would they would punish uh, uh, anything and everything we would do to try to share this produce or eat it or consume it. Great. Um, all right. So, yeah, um, BP or JT, I think kind of the floor is yours to kind of react and respond um, to to the pre-recorded um, clips. BP, would you like to jump in or should I go ahead? Um, either way. Um... I guess I could jump in if you want. Well, I mean, what brought to my mind is talking about how the environmental impact on them, which is really crucial because when we talk about like historically, and he, he referred to the Civil War specifically, um, even going to slavery at that point, um, they always used the scraps and the things that they didn't want, the things that were seen as bad for your health and, and gave it to us as food, right? And as they transitioned out of the slavery, moved into the, like, using us as chain gangs and holding us in very, like, contaminated facilities. Um, <clears throat> and this is good, like, it, it made me reminisce about specifically, like, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm blanking the, uh, the uprising that happened, uh, um, Attica. And how they were like doing tests on prisoners within side of Attica, um, as uh, using them as experiments and also living in very polluted environments. And one of the things we'll be uh, talk about FTP a little bit is how every like federal facility is built on top of a super fun site. Um, so they using us as a way to as like a national sacrificial site almost um, when they are building these prisons. It was very much with intent. Um, <clears throat> because we can see that not just like 
by where they put us and how polluted that land is when we're incarcerated, saying that as the ex-cons, well, I keep saying we, to be clear, people don't realize. Um, <clears throat> but also, like, like, the food they give us and the water. Like, when I was in Victorville, for example, the copper uh, race was extremely high in the water. I didn't even find that out until I joined FTP. I didn't know that that was something happening. And there was actually somebody that was that we built with that as was incarcerated in FTP with me. I didn't know them, but, like, we were in the same facility. Um, and so, uh, that's like, is the norm and not even just that, but going into history, like we also talk about the experiments they did on people. Um, like there was one I remember reading about a while back where they injected, uh, small amounts of plutonium into the bloodstream of people. Um, and that was a way of <laughs> testing what would happen to our bodies with those small amounts. And, uh, it's, <sighs> It's not like accidental. I want to say it's by design, um, and it, it's not only to break us as individuals, but to break our communities. You know, um, I guess that's all I really got to comment on off the top of my head. So, thank you for that. I think um, it is the case. It's very much the case that environmental racism and toxics. Uh, toxic prison site and brings to the fold the kind of disposability and exposure um, and extractionism and violence that um, creates the kind of wider um, political ecology that we're dealing with in a contemporary moment. And I think that what happens in terms of those, um, especially with the Superfund sites, um, with federal facilities and also just um, all kinds of uh, the siting of these kinds of spaces, it it mirrors what people on the outside, I think, in black and brown communities, in particular indigenous communities, face um, more broadly and on the outside, technically on the outside, right? Um, we we can think about um, that internationally. We can think about the ways, particularly, that anti-blackness is a fundamental grammar of racial capitalism. Um, globally, such that it names what where things can be taken from, um, but also where the toxic um, the toxic aspects or or material that's produced out of those relations where that can be dumped. Um, and I think that is that that prisons bring that um, bring that really to the center, right? They really make that really um, crystal clear and really sharp. Um, and I think. Also, I heard in there the connections between herbicide and ecocide, the intentional killing of of urban, but also rural communities um, is in many ways the same kind of um, outlook as the idea that an area can be or an ecology or an environment can be um, used uh, to the maximum and then disposed of. Right. We're we're. I think in that context, we're drawn to um, a function within um, wider Western thought, right? Um, one of the speakers mentioned just the kind of larger ecologies and geographies, I think, of white supremacy that's very much at play, right? Um, and I think uh, the references to, um, to thinking about um, how uh, this connects to a green future, a, a, a green, a liberatory green future. I want to be clear. I think there are lots of different green futures being articulated in our contemporary moment, but some of them don't undermine the fundamental um, dynamic, toxic dynamic, toxic stewardship that underwrites racial capitalism. They simply want to decarbonize, right? They simply want to remove carbon from that scenario so that we don't use coal or we're not using oil. And as 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 all of the kind of recent reports make clear, that's not even really happening, right? But even that horizon is a dangerous run. As we've seen uh, with Bolivia saying a few years back, no, we're not just going to um, open up and uh, sell off our lithium. Uh, you know, there was a coup in, within a couple of weeks after that, right? So we're already at a state, at a at a site, and in a place um, where that horizon, the horizon of a green future that's not connected, as Gilmore says, 
to a rare future, to an international future, to an abolitionist future is really no future at all. Yeah, we're going to pause briefly to do an interpreter switch. One second. OK, great. Um, yeah, thank you both, um, JT and VP. Yeah, I think um, just to kind of like riff a little bit on what you both just said, I mean, I think, um, you know, absolutely, I think, VP, what you're talking about with, um, you know, the environmental racism, it's not sort of an additional thing on top of prisons, right? It's, it's, it's by design, right? Prisons themselves are toxic. And I think that's going to be a theme that's going to carry through um, in, in the rest of the remarks. Um, and also, I was really struck by kind of, you know, Wayland's um, remarks about sort of, you know, it's, it's like redlining is environmental racism, right? Like needing to think beyond um, even just the side of the prison, although the prison absolutely is, is kind of critical and then central to this conversation in particular, but a green future, right, is going to require um, thinking even beyond um, those walls. So anyway, um, do either one of you want to kind of add anything else or before we move to the next the next clip? Um, I just want to, I guess, throw in there that um, for like in, in my mindset to have a green future that like literally requires abolition prison, right? Because it's the backbone of the military industrial complex. Like one of the programs that utilizes Unicor, which provides a lot of uh, labor to be able to get build uh, things like missiles or things also like as, as seemingly innocuous as trailers which carry all the weapons and those um well if we know anything about the military industrial complex and the prison industrial complex working together it's one of the biggest carbon emitters on top of it and carbon let's be real handling our carbon issues is not close to enough right now let's be 100 about it so um yeah that's that's all i really want to add though yeah, that's great. Um, JT, any any thoughts or do you want to just roll to the next um, clip? I think for now, let's roll to the next clip and we'll continue the threads, I think, that we're picking up here. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, John, why don't we roll to the next clip and then you get a chance. Well, something that's interesting to me is that public health experts are looking at prisons and their relationship to overall public health and have begun to discuss ideas of abolition as a necessary remedy to their effect on society as a whole. Many abolitionists have spoken about the taxpayer parts of prisons and how the mass caging of human beings sucks up community resources that could be used for other things such as academic development and technological research towards things like climate change. Massachusetts itself has a caged population of between seven and 8,000 people, yet their annual DOC budget is usually around 500 to $600 million. When we scale this out to bigger incarceration states such as California, boasting more than 160,000 caged citizens compared to the seven to 8,000 in Massachusetts, you can imagine what their annual budget looks like. When the government decides to take billions of taxpayer dollars out of something in order to build and run prisons, we know that those dollars are being stripped from poor and black and brown communities. In addition to the dollars being removed from our communities, when prisons are built, the institution or political intention is to fill them. And so the question becomes, with whom? Here, like when you look at the prison menu, it is say that one day we'll eat sweet and sour chicken over rice, you know, with, with pineapples in it. But it doesn't tell you that all of this this food and this and this meal is processed. So it appears that we're eating healthy foods or a delicious meal, but really it was over processed, frozen, overcooked, and then all the nutrients are, are being cooked out of it. So by the time we get it, it's just depleted with nutrients there. This is something that we know, but also we felt in our bodies, you know, over time of consuming this. So uh, the, the produce that 
they would provide outside of that with mostly or all GMO produce or just undesirable um, celery, carrots, uh, apples, oranges, you know, just the, the, the basic fruit and vegetables that probably would come from like surplus farms. And, uh, we, you know, a lot of this stuff was picked before it was ripe, you know, in, in, in whatever the prison or correctional industries, uh, however that was outsourced or that relationship with that, uh, farmer, uh, you know, you can kind of tell just by the quality of what we're getting that it was purely about capitalism. You know what I'm saying? It was just, you know, putting, giving some kind of economic opportunity to, uh, one of their one of their stakeholders versus actually going to the local farmer in the area that takes pride in what they're growing and growing stuff in season that's surrounding these prisons and getting it from there and that's what they used to do. So there's that difference in the menu when it when it switched over to correctional industry and the quality of food we're getting. Right now, I would like to take this opportunity to pose a very interesting This is a call from question. Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution, Cole Township. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. Three, two, one. Right now, I would like to take this opportunity to pose a very interesting and peculiar question. Do you happen to know what's a Superfund site? A Superfund site is a law that provides money from the U.S. government to clean up areas that have been polluted with dangerous substances, but that allows the government to demand money in the court of law from the companies that make the area dirty. What if the government knows the land is polluted, toxic, and uninhabitable, but intentionally and deliberately refrains from publicly declaring it as poison land? This is the government's big secret that the prison industrial complex utilizes to locate and construct the building of prisons throughout the nation. Do you know 600 United States prisons are built on top of toxic mine dump sites where profit over the value of human life is heavily emphasized? The staggering 2.2 million prisoners generating a wealth of revenue at the expense of being housed in federal and state prisons located within three miles of a super fun site. Tant amount to a death sentence, if you ask me. There are certain things that bring death to the forefront of my mind. Being in prison is one of them. Living in a toxic prison is one of them. And all prisons are toxic. All prisons contribute to the deterioration of health, sanity, family, community. Prisons have not made our communities any safer. They have not made human relations any healthier. Prisons are toxic. But this prison, SCI Fayette in Pennsylvania, is compounded in toxic. A report titled No Escape by the ALC and the HRC exposes that Fayette is surrounded by 40 million tons of waste two coal slurry ponds and millions of cubic yards of coal combustion waste. They say SDI Fayette is inescapably situated in the midst of a massive toxic waste dump. That's true. When I go outside to the yard, I'm surrounded by hills of coal waste, mountains of coal waste. One of the speakers brought to the fore with the pointed statement that all prisons are toxic, right? Um, and and connect that back through um, what some uh, some of the other kinds of comments that are threaded throughout about the nutritional violence, especially. I think the nutritional violence of, of prisons 
really replays um, the kind of violence of um, a, of starvation and of kind of forced uh, feeding that happens across um, the different sites of this location and also this commoning that um, an enclosure that happened starting with the slave castle and the slave ship as a as a nexus where um, and where people are part of the preparation for uh, the transatlantic journey is a kind of persistent hunger um, where in that kind of um, in the hull of the ship and in uh, the kind of castles that precede that space, um, people are um, were crowded together um, and eating all kinds of stuff that they would not have eaten in their day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, uh, how that extends to the, the enclosure of the plantation in the context of the Americas um, through, again, uh, a um, at least in the antebellum period and in the U.S. context, um, the combined a combined formation of nutritional violence, one that uses starvation but also heightens starvation through um, and and a day to day lack of food through um, through through feasting right through these kinds of eventful um, moments where and that really struck me with the comment that was made um, about the kind of over processed food food that that for the moment feels like it's nutritious or tastes okay um, but the reality that that's toxic. Um, I think that resonates very, very importantly with plantation enclosures and the kind of food um, system in which people are forced to work um, long, long uh, drudgery, hours full of drudgery um, and starve, but also periodically given a feast, again, to enhance the violence of regular day to day starvation. Um, and I think that that kind of although I think there's a moment of possibility during radical reconstruction, um, when you get to the chain gang and Jim Crow enclosure, that's also a moment in which, especially for black people, um, nutritional violence is central to that, right? Um, whether and, and as Carter G. Woodson says in his 1930 Rural Negro, um, you know, what had been the open uh, hunting ground and the open fishing ground suddenly are transformed in the 19 by the 1920s between the 1880s and the 1920s into sites of uh, private white leisure right and so what had been these kind of open spaces um along with uh sites of 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 uh black agricultural and aquacultural production um jim crow is a regime again of enforced starvation right and I think that we that continues into the kind of euphemized uh, system of food, violent food inequality that is often um, codified or hidden under uh, the discourse of the food desert, which I think um, Ashante Reese and other people have really pushed back against. Um, first of all, it euphemizes the reality that um, these are intentional decisions that are connected to political and social control. Um, and I, I think it, it that system um, also continues to kind of show the shared disposability between our communities inside and outside and the need again um, to go back to be peace point uh, for abolition for to really disrupt and interrupt these kinds of legacies and ongoing practices of violent nutritional toxicity. Great. Um, BP, before you speak, we're going to do a quick pause um, to switch interpreters. Okay, good. Great. Um, okay, BP, uh, go for it. So, I mean, stick on the same thing, uh, theme of food. Um, like like I mentioned earlier about like how it started with the scraps and slavery, I'm, I must speak a lot of exper experiential from this. Um, one of the things I remember when I was specifically in Victorville USP was the fact that we had, uh, you know, people would take food out the kitchen. One of the things that people had noticed is that a lot of the protein specifically, but a lot of food in general had things like not for human consumption right there on the labels of the containers. And so, like, it goes back to, like, like they're saying, uh, uh, the toxicity of everything that's happening there from the food up. And then not to mention that when you talk about that, 
of like how we're kind of low key starving in there and they keep us a minimum calorie diet as possible. That pushes us to buy commissary, right? But commissary itself might be higher quality, but not by much, right? It's literally top ramen or like those little sausages you can get at the store. You know what I mean? At, the, at any 7 Eleven, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> And that's what people live off of, and that's the upgrade. That's that's getting better than what you would be eating out of the uh, kitchen. And uh, I remember, like, one of the things that I had to witness specifically was a person that was literally growing a tumor out of their head. And now, I don't know if it was the diet or what it was, but they weren't even trying to give them medical care because I was in a USP, so a lot of people aren't really going home. And so when it comes to medical care, like, that's, that's, not, that's not really a real thing. Unless you get a broken bone, but even at that, like, my shit did not get uh, placed when they – Cassidy, you know what I mean? They just let it do its thing. Um, so, uh, and then one of the things is like, um, you mentioned the new Jim, the new Jim Crow, and the thing is, I always want to emphasize that the new Jim Crow isn't in prison. This, that's the new slavery, right? Uh, the new Jim Crow is when we get out, right? And then one of the things we are quickly banished to by having a record and having felonies is to live in, in environments that are completely polluted, like and also living off of cheap, high carb food that tends to be very unhealthy and highly processed, even on the outside. And then trying to get out of those cycles, a lot of times will land us right back into prison. And then it just commits cycle. And then you wonder why people reoffend because options aren't really there to get out. Like, like for example, like we mentioned, food deserts. Going out and then you can eat at Seven Eleven because you don't have a car, or you can hustle, buy a car, go buy food other places, and then by hustling you end up getting locked up eventually and going back to prison. And like, like, what are your choices really? And the um, how it seems to be an intentional pushing us into those corners and not just polluting the prisons, but the environments we grew up with in the first place and keeping us there and keeping us in poverty. Not that we wanna. I don't want to advocate moving away from the way we grew up, but instead uh, enhancing the places we lived in so we could actually have prosperity within those places and still retain community. Um, I think it is, like I, I said I, I, I before, I think it's by design. I think it's intentional. I don't think these were done by accident. Like, oh, we just don't care. So let's just go bad. And I think that's the, the sense a lot of like uh, liberal philosophy wants to believe, but I don't really buy that. It seems that all of it was intentionally put in place to keep these cycles happening, to make sure that people find themselves in the same situations and not being able to get out of those situations because one, capitalism itself needs um, a labor source, a primitive labor source to keep itself surviving. It needs a pull from something and that's where the slave labor comes in those inside of prisons, but also it needs to make sure that people find their place with society and stay there. And what I mean their place is the place that capitalism has assigned them. And that means being slaves and being impoverished, being the service workers at best, if you're lucky. And uh, one of the things is, well, where are we going to put toxic areas? The people who we throw towards the margins, that's where we're going to put all the toxic areas. That's where we're going to, like, cipher into toxicity to the most. Not that, it, that anybody's immune from it because it affects everybody, but, yeah, I guess it's all I'm going to say for right now. Could I, could I say that that cycle of you know, violence and um, and starvation and kind of hunger that you mentioned, uh, BP, I think, you know, I, that, again, it's not to make an easy slippage between different key moments and the kind of history and the kind of different political situations. But I, I think I've been struck, I, I was struck by um, recently looking through, you know, just uh, court records for Essex County, Virginia in the 18th century. This is original plantation, Virginia, um, settled illegally in the 1640s, um, even by the crown's own, you know, the, the English crown's own law settled illegally. And, and in the 1750s, increasingly um, settled legally, quote unquote, but of course, uh, pressure, pressing against the Rappahannock and other groups in the in the power tank um, in the power tank Confederacy, um, but plantations in the 17th and 18th century, like in this area, really depended on hunger. Right? They de they depended on um, the uh, the um, the kind of physical malleability and plasticity of of enslaved people's bodies, and um, that included. Africans and that included indigenous people in this context um, to be forged in hunger. And that often led to um, a, this cycle of punishment and violence and all of that for theft for food. So, for example, 
um, in the in the 1650s and 1660s forward. There are a bunch of cases in Essex County of people who have literally had their near, their ears nailed to the public pillory for days because they stole in a hog or, or because they have um, broken into a storehouse to eat um, something that they're not supposed to. But I also want to emphasize the fact that, I mean, I think this will come out more as we talk, um, the reality that despite the kind of plantation, these various rounds of enclosure and the way that they delimited food, black experiences with food to hunger or forced glut and a, some combination of that, um, that there was always resistance, right? That there was always this, um, you know, first of all, the fact that people, even though we capture their stories or get their stories when they're caught, people who are hog stealing and sharing hogs in the woods, that's a whole other kind of fugitive relationship um, that doesn't correspond with um, the what the plantation's logics are about where people should be and, and what they should eat and when and all those other things. Um, but I, I think also a kind of black commons where where black people uh, fish engage the land in, in partially indigenized ways and often in relation to indigenous people as well to create all kinds of alternatives. And I think, um, you know, that will come out more when we talk a bit more about resistances, but I think that's so key um, that, that even in those contexts, uh, on slave ships, in slave castles, on plantations, during the Jim Crow era, you know, and up through our own moment of confinement and nutritional violence, between the nexus of the prison and our communities, that um, there's all kinds of alternatives that are percolating. Um, and it's about abolition is about putting those forward as well, as much as it's about destroying um, the incarceration and the violence of that. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you both. That's actually a pretty good segue into our next clip. So maybe we can turn to that now. And I think in this next clip, we'll sort of get into these a conversation about resistance and perhaps also about, you know, the challenges of um, kind of doing this work uh, around uh, the environment and and the planet in the free world and sort of how you know like free world organ like environmental organizations um, think about these issues and the challenges of sort of building there. Um, so yeah, John, why don't we um, let that roll? And the local free world community is also affected by this. And they filed a lawsuit. And from what's been reported to me, that at first they collaborated with anti-prison organizers. But once they got some relief, once they won their lawsuit, they forgot all about the organizers and the prisoners that were fighting with them. The correctional officers at the prison also filed suit. In mediation, they were given the option of being able to bring their own bottled water rather than drinking the water at the prison. And of course, they were never, they never even considered prisoners in the first place. And to this day, prisoners remain captive in the same conditions that both of those groups fought against. We're still in the same spot. Clearly, some people are considered more disposable than others. And this is not a case of trying to argue about who is more oppressed. It's just to recognize that they're in the hierarchy. And those lowest on that hierarchy have a higher level of disposability. And what does it mean to be disposable? Just think about a garbage disposal. All the food someone doesn't want gets thrown down the sink, chopped into pieces, and flushed away. And this is what happens to us. The powerful have no need for us. So they throw us away, chop up our minds, and discard us. And when you're considered to be trash, you can be disposed of in the most toxic conditions. That this, these foods, you know what I'm saying, and what's being put in the food, and the quality of health care and all that stuff that, that comes with it, a lot of us, you know, fear that we won't make it home, you know, and that's something that as an organizer like myself, an activist like myself, is, 
I have to do a lot of work, you know, with my peers, you know what I'm saying? I'm letting them know, like, hey, look, you got to get a job in the garden and just giving them different strategies and tactics to use to get a healthier access or a free spot, someone who's really struggling with their health, you know, we, we'll, we'll do everything we can to provide for that individual, you know what I'm saying? And no matter what the consequences, they come with that, you know what I mean? It's more of, we got to take care of each other, you know what I mean? Because if, if the community isn't able to provide the kind of support that it needed and the prisons ain't budget, ultimately it does come back down to us, you know, and that's what, you know, we, we realize the power in grassroots organizing, you know what I'm saying? And mutual aid inside, you know, and even, even though it's a small scale, it does, it does, it, it, it helps our situation and it does save lives and it helps people, you know, stay grounded and, and actively engaged in, you know, what we got to do to change our situation. You know, I think about what does it mean to battle environmental injustice when you're not even considered or recognized as human? What does it mean to fight environmental injustice while you're being held captive? That means that the free world folks who are also fighting against environmental injustice need to recognize that they have allies and accomplices behind the wall. That our dehumanization originates from the same source as their dehumanization. That our incarceration originates from the same people and institutions as their oppression. You gotta recognize that the same systems and people that cannibalize the earth for profit are the same systems and people that are cannibalizing prisoners. Cannibalizing prisoners to maintain a white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist, heteronormative, patriarchal social order. The oppression is from the same source. And then when you do finally realize that we're fighting the same enemy, start examining the many ways the enemy has pitted you against us and us against you and dismantle that shit. There was a collective of us, mainly lifers and people with long sentences that that were very, very uh, afraid for what kind of effects this CI products were going to have on their bodies and their mental health. So... You know, we, we have long conversations out there in that space as we're building greenhouses, uh, composting systems, aquaponics. We also build plots for prisoners to uh, rent at $5 for a whole season. You can rent from April to uh, September. So it's basically the funding was going back into the horticulture program to get seeds and, and materials to sustain the program. But it was basically ran by us and, and for us. And it was something that we had to take care of and uh, nurture and grow and teach each other about because we weren't, there was no class around horticulture or uh, food science or any of that. So we would collectively study books that family members would sit in. We'd have long conversations about, you know, uh, what healthier food, uh, how it, how it benefit us, you know, different ways to share it, you know, although it's against the rules, you know, to barter and trade inside. And we just kind of grew our knowledge collectively just based on our lived experience with growing a, a program where all we were given was the permission and the tools and supplies to build it, and that was it. So that experience alone really made me be like, you know, this is something I really got to take serious and learn more about and read everything I can and study everything I can because this is for our survival.
Um, I think that you know I want to play with the metaphor, the the metaphors of cannibalizing people in the earth um, that one of the speakers mentioned, and also the reality and possibilities of um, of shared food and the and the capacities for that to be transformative. I think um, that's such a powerful metaphor for not only the kind of situation or or directly linking the situation between incarceration and the kind of disposability of people, but also the kinds uh, that's evidence there, but also the kinds of um, violent uh, re-territorializing of the planet itself that can be understood and under the rubric of cannibalizing. It reminds me of Dolores Williams, um, a black uh, theologian, womanist theologian, writing in the 1990s and comparing um, what so-called breeder women under slavery, women who were forced into sexual uh, relationships with people um, because they were understood as being able to produce a future offspring, a future slave population, and strip mining in the 1990s, right? Um, Dolores Williams makes the connection between how those are interrelated processes historically and in ongoing ways. And I think that cannibalizing is such a powerful metaphor as well. Um, as I think, you know, go, again, going back to what I was saying about the kind of rounds of enclosure that precede the prison, um, the contemporary prison industrial complex, um, I mean, often, often um, enslaved Africans who were brought onto slave ships imagined that they were going to be cannibalized. And I think, you know, um, so I think about Equiano um, really imagining that these people were about to eat and consume him. Um, I think we've tended to understand that as some kind of naive um, interpretation. But when we understand the ways in which slaves um, as in the Caribbean and on sugar plantations that are the kind of commercial uh, origins of um, of industrial capitalism um, and of the mercantilist system, slaves are disposed of, right? I mean, they're used within, you know, the average lifespan is seven years. And so they are cannibalized. And so that kind of, that metaphor resonates, I think, across these kinds of um, different modes of enclosure. And I think a, an important counterpart or counterpoint to cannibalizing as a metaphor, again, is commensality. Like really, um, I was struck by that person really talking about the possibilities and power of um, collectively growing food and other um, means that bring people together through reciprocity. That struck me, especially um, the, the uh, facility, state facility that's closest to my hometown in Tappanic, Virginia was the Haynesville Correctional Center. Um, and in that case, they didn't they didn't drop a prison on top of a Superfund site, but what they did was place it in an old agricultural field, right? Um, that, you know, I'm thinking with Gilmore's um, understandings of excess land and excess state power um, and excess people, how that materializes the, you know, in the context of California, the Gulag state, but also in places like Virginia. Um, similarly, um, and these, so these old agricultural fields are, are, are have a long history of being disposable as landscapes that being tied to the history of disposability um, from slavery and Jim Crow and black black communities. Um, but now being the kind of site of these kind of facilities that continue to cannibalize our communities. And I think cannibalize is such an important metaphor as well for the political situation and gerrymandering and the kind of violent redistricting that happens in front of our faces. Right. Where where um, people are placed in these kind of facilities, shifting the whole political and economic balance of state budgets and stuff. Right. Um, so I think. Um, that and so cannibal cannibalization and commensality are really powerful. I think metaphors for um, the current situation in terms of cannibalization and also the possibilities for a future through commensality. How we sit together, how we eat together, is really the kind of basis for the world we need, the abolition world we need. Um. <clears throat> So I also want to go ahead and say that is a really good analogy. Uh, use cannibalistic uh, in this nature because 
I think it's a metaphor, but I think it's like some degree is material reality, right? Because when you go to prisons, inherently cannibalistic, right? Because they take you from our community and it devour you into the system that then it uses and devours your labor, devours your very existence, not just your labor, but your very existence to bring itself uh, material benefit, bring itself resource. And, and I think like that was like dead on point when he said that. And uh, it also made me think about like when he said disposable as well, like who is disposable? Right, because who is disposable is poor black and brown communities, poor indigenous communities. That's who they find disposable. The same people they brought over here to do slavery, the same people they genocided to steal the land from in the first place, and they're just perpetuating an ongoing genocide. Like people, people see this as just like some sort of just just oppression, but it's more than that. It's like genocides can last long periods of time. They're removing children from homes and putting them into juveniles, then send them to the prison industrial complex afterwards. Those things are literally, like, when you look at the definition of genocide within that system of genocide. And <clears throat> that's also part of what, like, is devouring about it, right? Committing a genocide is to take those bodies and use those bodies to feed yourself, right? And so I know people think cannibalism is like, oh, we get a knife and a fork and get to eating, right? But that's not what they're talking about. That's like that's not how they're doing it. But they are devouring us nonetheless. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I want to feel like I feel like the brother underestimated themselves a little bit because he said um, that there's allies behind the wall. But I, I would say it's not just allies behind the wall. Wall. It's the forefront behind the wall. That's the front of the struggle. That isn't the back at all by any means. And when we think about it as people who are sitting here walking streets under as somebody, I, as, honestly, an enemy, but said very wisely was uh, on the low, lower custody prison, because this isn't a free society either. They, they were literally coerced into cooperation by the existence of these things. Um, especially if you're black, brown, or indigenous, especially if you're impoverished. This is how they keep us going is because that threat and the threat of violence that is prison, that is the people who are coming and catching you, the slave catchers that are called police, the violence that are going to per per uh, perpetrate against you in an attempt to take you into slavery, right? And it made me also think about, like, when they were talking about, it made me think back when we are talking about, like, how uh the what's introduced to their bodies right but it made me think about covid right because i don't know if people realize but covid testing was one of the first things it was first done or was uh, proposed to be done to prisoners and as a, as a way to like test the covid vaccine right but not because they wanted to make sure that people inside were safe but because they wanted to make sure that oh we have some test subjects that nobody's going to care about um and then at the same moment, they were not giving people masks or providing the necessary things to be able to keep COVID from spreading. So that like that is also in a way devouring people's bodies. That's taking that and like that experiment, using that energy, using their life force and, and risking their lives to be able to provide while not even doing the minimal to keep them safe. And of course, why would a system that is based off of slavery keep their slaves safe. Because let's be honest, when people are in prison, they are being enslaved. They start talking a lot about how they were gardening and mutual aid. And one of the things that made me think about too, when I was incarcerated is uh, when I got to prison, the actual prison, USP Victorville, one of the first things is uh, we have things called cars. A car is like the group you belong to with inside the prison, right? So the black car would come and bring you high gene items and, and care items, which was like basic mutual aid to start off with just because you were black. No, nothing in return. I know there's all these stories and stuff about which you got to be feared, but that, that care package was legit. Uh, they were like soap, um, maybe some soup, some things that just keep you going so that you get your money in your books or whatever to be able to provide for yourself. And I think a lot about how like prison in some ways is one of the forefronts of mutual aid because people depend on each other within side prison to be able to survive. Whether well, you're talking about like food and resources or whether you're talking about politically and like being able to be a safety net. For example, black folks stick together in case there's race conflicts. Um, and so those things are being interdependent and understanding that we are independent beings. But it's not we're something that we are divided from on the outside a lot of times, and we don't think about until it's necessary. But when you're in prison, it very quickly becomes necessary because 
you have to deal with each other and you have to deal with the system that is like literally holding you enslaved and the guards that commit so much violence against you at any given time depending on their moods or how, or if you dare to stand up to them um so yeah that's can can i add to that a bit um thank you for that i think um i think in the other context that we've been riffing through in terms of um, you know, the context of slavery and abolition um, in the kind of original U.S. Um, sense, I think mutual aid was also the day-to-day -day work of abolition in that context. I mean, I think if you listen, if you look or um, read up, uh, uh, narratives from formerly enslaved people who were interviewed in the 1930s, um, who were, you know, young people during slavery, they mentioned the ways that runaways um, permanent and, and semi-permanent runaways really depended on the day-to-day -day, um, mutual aid uh, of other other slaves, whether it's through their garden plots and other um, stuff, handing off food or um, or helping them to hide or alerting them about what's about to happen. I mean, and I think when we think about kind of revolutionary abolition in that context we think of uh, of someone like nat turner nat turner it, it takes them six weeks to find him in a in a cave meaning somebody was feeding him right um and i think those those kinds of um i think those day-to-day -day acts of mutual aid are what allow um slaves in the context of the 1860s when the union army approached to know that it was time to go Right. It was that day to day mutual aid, that day to day um, moving through the woods to, to create sociality and, and formulations for living together um, uh, through black collectivities that allowed them to um, amass a, a, a massive uh, disruption of slavery and to end it right during the Civil War. And I think also I wanted to say that ecocide and herbicide and disposability um, really bring out um, uh, animalization and, and the kind of um, marking of of animality. I think that ecocide and herbicide, that's another, and I'm I'm thinking about Zakia Juan Jackson's work here, but I think there's something about the demarcation of animalization in relation to black communities, especially indigenous communities as well. And and even the kind of marking of the territory of animals as somewhere out over there that can be disposed of, that those are two related um, ways of engaging the world through racial capitalism that have so many consequences for humans and the biosphere, right? Um, so I just wanted to highlight that shared grammar of disposability that happens between, uh, as Jackson points out, between the animal and animalization. Perfect. Um, uh, it, oh, yeah. Go ahead, BP. Or I just want to ask a question that I don't really answer for, but I just want people to think about. Um, they talk about like runaways, like hiding at Turner, for example. And, and then I think a lot of people, how they would say they would be part of, of the Underground Railroad. But I want people to ask themselves, how many people would be willing to hide somebody with a warrant, especially a big one? Yeah, um, thank you both. And I appreciate that question, VP, that hopefully can come back. Um, I, I want to just looking at the time, want to make sure we get to the next pre-recorded video. Um, so I think we're going to roll into that now and then we'll come back for kind of final remarks and maybe some Q&A if we have time. majority of the prison population, environmental racism is seen in various forms, primarily the form in which people of color are the dominant makeup of prisons. Herein lies the issue. We all know the statistics prove disproportionate impacts the health risk of those amongst communities of color. If blacks and Latinos were incarcerated at the same time, or rather at the same rate, as their white counterparts, the prison population would decrease an astonishing 40% overall. With a number that significant, we can't turn a blind eye by permitting the corporate raiders, destroyers of mankind to continue to build 
these prisons on or around toxic mine sites. You know, and imperialism and, and, and corporate codes and corporate rules and all that make it seem like we don't have a right to share and express as humans in those kind of ways. You know, and they do have a lot of zoning, coding, and just different codes and, and laws and regulations that will try to prevent that process. We got to dismantle those barriers. You know what I'm saying? We got to we got to really, really just just take back. You know what I'm saying? Our right, reaffirm our right to access adequate, nutrient dense foods, and knowing that we have the skills and the ability to produce these things in our backyard, in the community parks, you know, in these spaces that we're living around, you know, and really looking at and learning from the indigenous people, you know what I'm saying, that the land here was stolen from, you know, and learning from them on better ways to steward land, you know what I mean, and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, produce natural resources that can sustain not just humans, but non-human living things as well. And the connection with all that, you know, the more we connect sustainability, agroecology, uh, abolition, and in in these practices, you know, the more closer we can get to actual autonomy, independence, and self-determination, freedom, and ultimately progress. You know, as a people, uh, free from uh, colonialism. As a final thought, awareness and education is the first step to ending environmental racism in prisons because the sad truth is that a great percentage of inmates and even their family members lack the awareness of their toxic grounds. As an environmentalist, I would rather have one good eye than the two evil eyes that the corporate raiders and destroyers continue to have in building and locating and constructing these prisons on toxic, polluted, uninhabitable lands. I've heard people say that none of us will be free until all of us are free. But it seems like as soon as some people get free, in this case, free from a life of toxicity, well, at least in their minds, free from a life of toxicity, then as soon as they achieve that, they forget about the people still fighting that battle. They forget about the people lower on the hierarchy than them. And that's an issue that abolition questions. Are you fighting for all people to be free? Or are you fighting for a higher level on the social hierarchy? So it's upon us to not only unite based on a shared sense of oppression, but also recognize the ways that we may be complicit in the oppression of others. How does our privilege harm each other? And how can we use those privileges to even out power across the people? Once we're successful with abolishing the systems that are oppressing the people, we got to have something in place that can sustain us for generations, that can be regenerated through processes that don't deplete the earth, that don't deplete non-human living beings, and the things that don't deplete humanity. And that's the, that's the real connection that I find myself thinking about often and building on. Great. Um, so just looking at the time a little bit, um, I want JT and BP to kind of respond to that, that that last clip of takeaways, but I also wanted to maybe pull in a couple of the questions that are coming up in the chat as sort of maybe kind of a culminating series of remarks or thoughts. So some folks are 
you know, kind of asking, you know, what it like all of you, know, I think we've done a really good job in this panel sort of defining the problems um, and, and the issues and historicizing and, and, and building that that context. But um, folks want to know, you know, like, what does an abolitionist green future look like? What does it entail? Um, and I think, you know, some of the remarks from the last clip kind of touched on this as well, but it would be great to hear from both of you, you know, maybe in your own organizing or your own work, kind of how you're building towards um, abolitionist green futures and and perhaps what, you know, folks who are on this call can do um, to kind of be a part of that effort as well. So either one of you can, can take it away. I guess I can hop in. Um, so uh, I don't want to uh, respond to uh, a couple of the things I said first. Um, are you fighting for all to be free? What about the bottoms? This is what I wrote down as my notes. Because I was thinking about that. I was like, to be honest, as someone who's been organizing for over a decade at this point, like on the ground, it does seem like there's a big pattern of people wanting just to get themselves free. Like, talk about everybody, but then as soon as you get to that point where they cool, let's just stop. And I think we really got to ask ourselves internally, like, are we really about getting everybody free? And if not, then where do we really stand within this struggle? Um, I think it's really important to see that it has to be material in my mind too. It can't just be like we post on Facebook. We say some some little little comments on Twitter. Like that doesn't like cool like spread spread like we should abolish stuff, but we actually gotta take material actions. So in my mindset, and I think this kind of goes to like what creates the answers, um, I see myself as like a phenomenon decolonizer, right? So I think of material decolonization. That means material abolition of prisons. That means removal of the prisons. Like that means tearing them down, stopping them from building new ones. Um, it, it means like actually deconstructing the system. Like not just in word, not just. I, I wouldn't say just vote our way out, but literally removing the material uh, resources that gives itself power from its hands. Um, trying to be careful, how I say things, but. Uh, um, I think those are the things that are going to need to be done to make changes. I can't, we can't think of like decolonization and just like, oh, in theory, if we start thinking different, no, we got to actually materially change and take the power out of the, take the hand, the power out of the hands that it's sitting in. Um, we have to remove that. Otherwise those things, changes aren't going to happen because we can try to legislate it away and we should use those tools where we can use them where they're actually beneficial. But it will never be enough unless we take material action, right? Material action can look in a million different ways, from boycotting the ways that they get money to maybe materially blocking them from making a benefit off of prisons in one way or another. That could be like thinking about where are these materials that are being made with slave labor going? Maybe you can block that. I don't know. I'm not going to say what to do or what not to do, but I think when it is um, talking about this, it, we can't think of just in theory. We can't think about just in conversation. Um, and for one of the ways that, like, for example, FTP has done it is we combine things from on the ground tactics like we did in Electric County to uh, be able to uh, build support by having things as simple as dream boards, but also having plans and uh, taking direct actions, as well as uh, people um, fighting it legislationally challenging prisons on their environmental impact studies, a million different tactics, but trying to attack the material situation, um, not just trying to like philosophize about it. Like how can we actually physically stop it? By doing these things, we've been able to stop thus far for prisons and it's still a struggle to keep going. Probably unless we all get on it, like right now, probably longer than we'll be alive, but I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that we can change that tide because this is cru it's crucially important that we all take actual stands. I think one of the also things we got to think about going forward in uh, abolishing prisons is making solutions on the day to day. That means like being able to supply the resources people need, being able to house people, being able to like build networks of housing where we're interdependent and not dependent on the system. And that's how we're going to keep people from being uh, snatched up as easily through BS justification laws. They have to try much harder to do so. And we have to take those stands and build those actual communities because us being pulled apart and being separate, being individuals, is a big part of how they're able to control us and being able to hold up the prison industrial complex. But I don't think we can just like say uh, lessen the pain. We got to do that too, but we have to also be like, how do we stop it? How do we stop the damage that's going on? And that comes from multiple different types of direct action. That comes from also building support networks, building mutual aid. It's not just a uh, it's just not it's not just in theory but in action 
Um, and I think what it can look like, well, I think we could look look at a society where prisons aren't a thing, where we act, we solve our problems with inside our communities and have autonomy and share resources instead of having to scrap and fight for them. And the only people that ha- are going to really suffer from that are the people who have been benefiting off the slavery, benefiting, benefiting off the theft that sit in their billion, their multi-million dollar houses with billions and billions of dollars. That's who's going to really like not like that happening, but the rest of us are going to do way better. But we got to see it from the bottom up. If we think that it's going to happen from where we're sitting at a level, at whatever privilege level we're sitting at, uh, up, then it's not going to work. We got to go to the very bottom and figure out how do we elevate the bottom? Because by elevating the bottom, we elevate all of us. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think, I think you know, for sure, decolonization, um, abolition, those are metaphors. They have to be real and they have to be, um, uh, you know, they have to tack to, to everyday actions and our tactics to get in there. And I think, again, I want to hold out the metaphor, even though I don't mean it just in a kind of airy sense, a commensality. I think that's a how we come back together, how we rebuild our communities in the wake of of herbicide and ecocide is how we disrupt incarceration and also how we plot a green future. I think um, I think we're I personally have been involved with people strike, um, which uh, people strike emerge um, when uh, folks with cooperation Jackson in the face of COVID called for um, a general strike um, to gain you know, to gain the power and the, co- the collective power to have mass disruption when it comes to, um, you know, what what COVID brought to the fore in terms of disposability, both inside, but uh, especially inside, but also outside. Right. And so I think um, I think for us, uh, we're trying to build um, through uh, uh, people's movement assembly, which is our kind of next uh, move. Uh, building out from the grammar of that work that uh, people that um, Cooperation Jackson has been involved in to try to build new systems. It's um, I think we're uh, we're we're clear that um, there is um, there is no kind of alternative that isn't abolitionist, and there's um, and there's no green future without abolition. I want to say that, um, and there's also no. Um, there's also no. It, I'm actually really just returning to to Ruthie Gilmore's metaphors, right? Um, you know, we have to think about these and be in action um, as well in in global solidarity. And I think about, you know, for example, a, a, a collective that's out um, in a township just outside of Cape Town in South Africa named Ujama um, that is doing radical work around, um, uh, you know you know, guerrilla gardening, right? There's such a limited space in the township, you know, that really takes the metaphor of prison inside and outside to its limit, right? Um, And yet they find open square inches, open square feet to plant, right? To feed and without fences, right? And I think that's the kind of um, work that we can do because not only is it materially real and it helps people to, um, but but it helps to see these kind of alternatives um, the reality is that oil is not a future at all, and it's one that's still being banked on, quite literally banked on. Um, prisons are not a future at all, and yet they're being ones that are literally being banked on. So I think part of it um, is direct action, um, and part of it is the kind of um, in, interior work around how do we build our own communities so that we, you know, how do we rebuild them around different values um, so that we're not um, just being siphoned into racial global capitalist systems um, that destroy us, that destroy the planet, and they consider us and all life on the planet ultimately expendable for profit, right? Um, I think, um, and I think, again, I want to underscore decolonization is not a metaphor. That means um, that means indigenous sovereignties. That means the return of prison lands as well as any other lands to indigenous sovereignties. Um, and I think alongside indiv- indigenous sovereignties, for example, in places like the communities I mentioned in Virginia, 
um, uh, you know, the, the historical practices of the black commons, the ways that black communities in a day to day way create reciprocity with each other through the land and the waterscapes. That really is the that is the seed. That is the trajectory. That is the future in many ways. Um, and if it's not, then we're doomed in many ways. I think it, it that really is um, a return to our own ability to feed ourselves collectively um, to care for each other to, uh, it, it is the future. So thank you. Great. We're going to pause for a second to do a switch. Great. Um, yeah, I, um, I think we're at time, so I want to, I want to respect that. Um, so, but any final last tidbits from JT or BP you want to throw in there, or we can just close on out. All right, great. Um, so thank you so much um, to everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you to our panelists, Sophia, Waylon, Bryant, Lawrence, BP, and JT. To Haymarket, our captioner, and the interpretation team with Coco for all their work to make this panel happen. And we hope to see everyone on November 9th, 7 p.m. Eastern, for our next conversation, Abolition Must Be Read, um, again with Stephen Wilson and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. So thank you all, and thanks for joining us this evening. <laughs>